Okay, guys, we are recording latest episode of Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. Video peeps, you get this large and in charge and live. So just stand by with us for just a second. We're going to grab some quick gnat sound, and then we will give a counter and kick this bad boy off. Audio folks, you guys get the sleek professional version. Stand by. And three, two. The following is a production of Shark Flight Media. Now entering the nexus of geekery and guy world in three, two, one, mark. Do you know what the secret of life is? One thing, just one thing. You know, that's just like uh, your opinion, man. This is the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. Hey kids, welcome back to another exciting edition of the Dudes in Hyperspace podcast. I am your host, Ian J. Malone, joined as always by my usual partners in crime, Rob Howe, Kevin Steverson. We'll get to those guys here in just a second. Got an exciting guest lined up for you tonight, folks. Big time, big time in the house. For those who are tuning in via video, you can see him right there in the corner. So I know it kind of spoils a surprise. Before we get to him, though, you've got to pay some bills. That would, of course, be saying a big fat thank you to our presenting sponsors at Chris Kennedy Publishing. It doesn't matter what you're into, folks. If it's military, sci-fi, space opera, paranormal romance, urban fantasy, high fantasy, they got it all over there. So check them out online, chriskennedypublishing.com. You can read about their books, their author series. Also sign up for their newsletter while you're there and uh, get yourself a free ebook in the process. They are the good folks at Chris Kennedy Publishing. You can find them once more at chriskennedypublishing.com. Also want to say a thank you as always to our friends over at the International Association of Science Fiction and Fantasy Authors. Love those folks, man. It doesn't matter if you are an author. It doesn't matter if you are a reader. Either one. Go to the website, IASFA.org. If you're a writer, meet some other writers, man. Grow that community, network, learn about your craft, learn about the business of publishing. It's all there and it's free. Readers, hey man, we got free book giveaways going on every single month that I ask for. So stick around coming up later on in our brand new aired out segments. We'll tell you about this month's giveaway happening from the fine folks at ASFA. So let's go ahead and jump into the show tonight. Rob, Kevin Steverson, how are we doing this evening, gentlemen? I'm doing great, sort of recovering after Penzik. Uh, that drive home is always tough. I came home to this, though, a couple of fresh copies, uh, my my pre-copies for No Game for Nights, the nice. uh, the anthology with Larry Correa and Casey Azell. I'm excited to be a part of that. So Heck that was yeah, a really nice treat to uh, walk home to. Way to level up, dude. Steverson, what's going on down in Georgia? Uh, I had to fight hard today not to take a nap because I had leftovers for lunch. Yesterday, I made chicken enchiladas, beef enchiladas, and of course, made enough for a few days. You know how that goes. Oh, yeah. So, yeah Those I'm actually just, freeze surprisingly well if you yeah, have too so much we, leftovers. We made, extra. We made right. extra just for that. Cool, cool. Well, we are rolling along in the house of Malone. It's, uh, I will warn everybody now, like the weather outside, kind of crusty. So uh, we got we got lightning in the area and thunder and all that good stuff. So if the power dies and the episode gets cut short, well, uh, just blame it on blame it on Mother Earth there, climate change or something or another. I, I don't know, but anyway, let's go ahead and get into our uh, get into our guest tonight, guys. Uh, for folks who are not paying are not tuning in via video, you're hearing this via my voice. Uh, this guy's a rock star. Okay, we are talking serious leveling up tonight. He is the New York Times bestselling author of uh, more than 170 books. He is the owner of Wordfire Press. He has written in the Dune universe, the Star Wars universe, the X-Files universe. He's also written in fantasy, horror, steampunk. Uh, let's see, what else has he done? Geez, he's written song lyrics. He's written in games. He's written in comic books. He's also a professor, by the way, at Western Colorado University, teaching kids about publishing and what it means to publish in the year 2022 and what a different animal that is. I would, of course, be talking about the one, the only, Mr. Kevin J. Anderson. Welcome to the Dudes in Hyperspace, my friend. How are you? Well, thanks. Now that the bio's over, we're out of time. So <laughs> <laughs> well, I just, yeah, you know, I wanted everybody to know what a special guest you are to bestow your presence upon us to see uh, me. I, I want everybody to know have, what that means. I have ADD, so it's like, well, I'm publishing now. No, I'm writing comics now. No, now I'm doing games now. And I just, I'm, I'm a professional fanboy, and I just love doing all of it. And, and it's, it's hard to say no when people say, "Hey, you want to work in the Batman universe, or you want to." Um, come write comic scripts for us or you want to write new novels in this and and i just i just 
love it. So obviously sure. I've been around for a while. Well, you know, and for those who know this show, they know right off the bat why we are so excited to talk to you and why, frankly, you're a very natural fit for this show. Obviously, we're three writers. We talk a lot about writing. We talk a lot about craft and books and publishing and all that stuff. But we also talk a lot about music on this show, among you know many other things from sports to popular culture. But music is a big deal to all three of us. It is a common thread that has united Rob and Kevin and I for some time. And, you know, you and I, when we met at Liberty Con, obviously we talked about books, but then it wasn't long before we were talking about classic rock music, man. So on all of those fronts, we have been excited for this interview for some time uh, because we knew we'd get to cover all that ground with you. So let's jump into this, man. You know, for those who are not terribly familiar with Kevin J. Anderson, the writer, how did you get your start in this business? Uh, did you start as a kid? When did you know this is what I want to do for a living? Crafting characters, crafting stories. Man, I, I knew when I was five years old, I, I was always kind of the monsters and comic books and stuff geek. And I remember when I was, I was literally five, I watched the old movie, The War of the Worlds yeah. and the Martians and the heat rays. And I just went, I love this. I want to tell stories like this. And I, I drew pictures of that movie on the little scratch pad. I couldn't write. I was five years old, but I drew pictures and I would tell the story out loud. And, and then I started to make up stories of my own and, and I, I wrote my first novel when I was eight years old on my dad's typewriter and uh, just just kept writing stories. My my parents, I think I was 10 or 11 years old. They got me a subscription to Writer's Digest for my Christmas present. All right. and like a gift I kept on giving every month. I got an issue of it that I got to go. And, and I got my first, uh, let's see, I think I was in 11th grade when I had my first story published and uh got actually paid for a story when I was 12 years old and, and I'm 800 rejections later and 175 books published. And, and here I am. So I've, I've never, I mean, I've, I've gotten other jobs to support my addiction to writing, but yeah. um, this was always my, my core. This was always what I wanted to do, telling stories. And, and it's just the way my brain is wired. And, and, you know, every time I'm like, I'm, I'm with the, my, my wife's family on Sunday afternoon, we have a, a dinner and they're playing card games. They're watching football. And my brain is just going, I could be writing now. I could be writing now. I could be uh -huh. writing. And uh, my mother-in-law will do the, you, you work too hard, Kevin, you should relax. I go, no, the work is not writing is, is that's the work part. And, and I just, I don't know. I, I feel like I'm really happy when I'm out telling another story. Cool, cool. Well, as noted, uh, you have written quite a few books since the tender age of five years old, which means you've had a lot of time to hone your craft and hone what it is that, that you do when you go to create one of these stories. For somebody who has not jumped into a Kevin J. Anderson book, tell me, in your opinion, what are the core traits that make a KJA story a KJA story? You know, I've I'm really, really, really good at plotting. I love how to tell stories and I love how to like the structure of stories work and, and, you know, and I'm, I'm flat out. I tell you what's happening so that you forget that you're reading. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not showing off how many metaphors and commas I can use and how many uh, big vocabulary words that I looked up in a thesaurus. I want you to forget that you're looking at words on the page. I want you to be in there with my, space marines or with my uh, dragon slayers or with my uh, x-files agents or whatever it's like you want to you want to fall in there and just be really living the story and one of the other things that i'm really pretty good at is my world building like i'll spend a lot of time just developing everything every little aspect of the the climate and the history and the the cultures and the politics and science and i just build the whole world of everything that I'm doing, which means I end up writing big fat books all the time. But yeah. uh, in fact, that goes hand in hand with the plotting because it's, um, you know, my my stuff, I, I did this whole big space opera thing called the Saga of Seven Sons. It was seven novels long. And then I did a sequel trilogy of, of well, trilogy is three books, uh, but they're all like big ones. And it, it's kind of like Game of Thrones with a million storylines and dozens of planets and all this sort of things. And and it all, it's this giant, it, it, it's like organizing this whole army moving towards something rather than like a character solo. So it's it's like Game of Thrones, except it's finished. Awesome. <laughs> well, let me, let me actually kind of hang on that for just a second. Talk to me a little bit about your process. 
right? If you know, okay, here's, I'm going to write a space opera story and it's going to have, or I'm going to write a military sci-fi story and I'm going to have space Marines and there's a conflict and there's fleets and all that. What does the process look like before you jump into plotting the actual story? How much time do you spend on world building before you actually start crafting the story itself? Or is that something that you just kind of keep a running tally on? And as the story unfolds, oh, I got to add that to the Bible. I got to go work on that. I got to go back to chapter four and tweak that because this just came to me. And I want that to be in the kind of in the overall tapestry of the thing. How does your process work for developing that? It's kind of like three three parts. It's like the world itself and the characters and the story. Okay. And like if, if I'm like completely from scratch, I'm going to start a brand new fantasy epic tomorrow. Um, I'm, I'm assuming I'll have some idea to start with that. Here's what I, what the storyline is, but then I'll, I'll like, oh, and, and the most important thing is this is, this is my magic secret weapon here. I always go out with a digital recorder. Gotcha. I, I, I live in Colorado. I go hiking all the time. Um, tomorrow I've got a day set out. I'm going to do like eight or nine miles and I'll write two or three chapters when I'm out walking. But if it's brand new blank slate, just trying to figure it out. I'll have some idea and I'll, I'll, I will go out with my tape, my recorder and I'll just, uh, well, what about the, uh, the dragons in this universe and how does the magic work and how did the history go? And I'll start like making that part up. And when I'm making all these really cool ideas up, then I've got to put that part into a storyline, right? Because if you have the, you know, the dragon guarding the rope bridge that's across the lava pool, well, that looks too cool that I, I need to have the characters go there to do something with it. So then I kind of put that into the plot, but then it goes around and then I need to know who the characters are and why they're doing it. So then I start, here's the characters and I'll like, here's King Drabix and I will just make up his storyline and I'll go through his life story. And then who is his brother and how did his wife die when a dragon ate her in the bed or, you know, something like that. And developing the characters also gives me the storyline. And then I start putting all these things together. And then I draw up my blueprint. And it's a very detailed blueprint. And, and I'm, a, I'm a plotter. I'm a full-on, I, I don't want to make it up as I'm going along. I want to know where my story's going. Because I, I, I would not hire an architect to build me a hotel if he was just going to start digging holes and putting up walls and hope they all fit together by the end. Love that analogy. I, I, if I'm going to do something as ambitious as writing a 200,000 word book, I damn well want to know how the roadmap works. Love it. And I spend all my time outlining it. And because my stuff usually has you know, nine different point of view characters or more, I, I like to do, in fact, we're, Brian Herbert and I are doing this right now for a Dune project. We, we like to come up with what we call a skeleton, which is sort of like a bullet point. Chapter one, uh, the Fremen attacked the Harkonnen spice operations. And, and then chapter two, the emperor learns about it and gets pissed off, you know, and, and little, little one-liners like that. And that's the way I can kind of get a 30,000 foot view of the whole story. And I'll, I'll look at that and I'll also color code it. So um the fremen are one like green ink and the emperor is blue ink and duke leto is red ink or whatever so i just change the color on it so i can just look at a glance man it's been a long time since i've had a red chapter ah or it's been a long time why are there three blue chapters in a row we got to break them up with something and that helps me figure out like the three-dimensional structure of it and after I like work and work and work at this skeleton outline, the one liner at a time, then it's all kind of set. And then I can go to each one of those one liners and then I'll write up a three paragraph. This is what happens in chapter one. And then this is what happens in chapter two. And that's really important when you're collaborating with somebody so that you're both having the same roadmap. That sure. I, I, I would never be able to collaborate with a pantser because I'd have it all mapped out and then they would just go off on their own way. Um, the other thing is I hate to rewrite. I feel like I've wasted my time writing this chapter if I'm going to throw it out. So that's why it's the old carpenters thing, measure twice and cut once. Yeah. Well, I want to spend my time up front looking at the blueprint so that I don't waste my time writing chapter 33 if it's going to end up on the cutting room floor. 
Wow. Okay. Um, that, that's fantastic stuff. One, I, uh, one, one story that I learned with the, the David Lynch movie of doom yeah. that he wrote the script and he actually filmed like a seven hour version of the movie, knowing he was going to have to cut it down to two hours. Mm. Well, mm -mm. man, if you're going to build scripts and film it and spend millions and millions of dollars, why don't we decide in the script stage whether or not we're going to cut this thing rather than after you built this whole set and spent $20 million filming it? Right. I, I don't understand that attitude. I, I want to I, I want to look at it beforehand and decide what I'm going to keep rather than wasting all that time. Now they just sell that as a director's cut and make more money is how that, that works. I'm not sure in 1984 that that was the plan. But. No, no, definitely before DVDs, if nothing else. Yeah. So, well, you know, one of the other things that you are very much known for, especially in writer circles as being a very, very, very diversified, prolific publisher, as well as an author. Uh, I listened to an interview recently with you and Joanna Penn of the creative Penn podcast. And you, I don't remember if it was, she gave this quote about you or you said it yourself, but if you want lightning to strike, plant lots of lightning rods. Okay. And that being that in this, you know, in today's climate, you can't just say, here's my masterpiece. Let's go get paid. Like you've got to be up on the wheel. You've got to be planning series. You've got to be out there in media. You've got to be hustling. You got to be beating the bushes to let people know that it's there. You have to do all of these things. In your case, it was starting your own press and wordfire press and becoming a hybrid author. We have a lot of authors who listen to this show. For somebody who may be looking to get their start in publishing today, what do you as Kevin J. Anderson think that they need to know right now to best position themselves to find success? Don't, don't quit your day job. Yeah. Well, uh, it's really funny because I just, you mentioned that I'm a, a professor as well. And I teach this whole master's degree program in publishing at Western Colorado University. And I'm, I'm starting my fourth year now. And I love it. I, I love teaching. I've done my superstars writing seminar for 14 years now and, and keep teach a lot at Dragon Con all the time. Um, but I just came back from a week in this university environment where I'm teaching. I, I had 11 graduating students and 15 new ones. And because I'm me with my connections, most of my students come from indie publishing, from superstars, from 20 books to 50K, from from all these places. And they're not like people who saw an academic ad in some journal that gets your degree in publishing. But the college that I that I teach at also has other concentrations as genre fiction and poetry and nature writing and things. And I just gave this whole talk about the state of publishing to the entire, um, the whole student body. And I was talking about the, the rise of indie publishing and one of the examples I used, who was a guest speaker for with us, was Michael Anderley, who formed LMBPN, a hugely prolific publisher and author, uh, one of the founders of 20 Books to 50K. And Michael, I, I joke with him because I always used to be the hack writer because I would publish four or five books a year that I, I got looked down upon by a lot of uh, awards and the literary people because how can you possibly write anything good if you're writing four books a year? Horrors, horrors. And Michael does like 15 or 16 books a year, mm -hmm. plus all these other co-writers and ghost writers. But he's identified um, what he calls whale readers, people that just like read a book every two days. They just want to keep reading. And if you don't give them the next one in the series, they'll move on to something else. Um, Chris Kennedy also, he's, he's one of our guest speakers coming up in a couple of weeks for my class. And so we are people who are like indie publishers, indie authors, we're prolific. We do this because what, if you're going to binge watch Breaking Bad, you don't want to wait two years between each episode. Right. And that's just the way it is. Well, what I'm teaching to these, the, the, the academic MFA students, they're like horrified because they want to take a year and a half to write their precious little novel. I go, well, fine, but don't expect to make a living at it if you're yeah. writing one book every two years. And, oh, I could never write that fast. I go, well, fine, but just don't get delusions that you're going to make your living as a writer. And it it is, um, it's kind of like the, when I was a kid, there were only three TV networks 
And there were that meant that there were three shows to watch every night. There was one on CBS, one on NBC, and one on ABC. And you know, it depends on what it was. And if you were that show, you got gosh, one third of America watched your show. Well, great if you were one of those one thirds. But now I've got three hundred different channels on my um, cable plans, plus Hulu and Netflix and everything else, and so. Even the most successful shows make a fraction of the audience share that those big three networks used to get because there's a million different things. Well, that's what you are in publishing now and as a writer, that you, you're got to find your niche. you got to find your fans. you got to identify the people that like your kind of stuff, which means pounding the pavement going to Liberty Con, going to a million different cons, going to conferences, setting up your newsletter, doing your social media. Um, if you want to be a writer and a publisher now and you don't have social media started, you don't have a website, you don't have a newsletter, get your butt in gear and get started. Wow. I, I'll be honest, I loved it in the 90s when I could just write books and send them in and then write the next book and send it in. That was my favorite time in my career. But I can complain about Betamax tapes not being around anymore, or I can figure out what to do. And I'd, I'd rather be a mammal than a dinosaur. Just, uh, just out of curiosity, you got a social network that you're prefer kind of lean toward. I follow you on Twitter and Facebook. And I do think from my own personal vantage point, I think you're a little bit more authentic on Twitter. Do you have a favorite platform you like to hang out on? Well, see, the problem with Twitter is it's so short and you can't do a lot. Yeah. Um, if I want to talk about, here's what my book's about. Um, and then there's so many trolls and stuff on Twitter too, sure. but, um, you, you're going to laugh, but this is totally serious. My favorite one is I liked MySpace because you could do stuff on MySpace that Facebook won't let you do yeah. and Twitter won't let you do. And, and on MySpace and, and, and no, I'm not that old guys. I'm just telling you, this is how it really worked <laughs> on MySpace. I ended up having 15,000 followers before MySpace kind of died. And what happened is if I posted, I'm here's my brand new book, Clockwork Angels, that just came out. And here's an excerpt from it. And I put it on my page. Guess what? All 15,000 people who said they liked Kevin Anderson actually got to read what I posted. Sure. Yep. And, I remember those days. And on MySpace, I could filter it because if I was doing a book signing in Chattanooga, Tennessee, I could search by zip code and find all of my fans that lived right within like a 50 mile radius. And I could just target them saying with an email here, guys, you live in Chattanooga. I'm doing a signing at this bookstore. Come see me. Yeah. Well, Facebook doesn't let me do that. Facebook throw, I have, I have something like 30,000 people across various Facebook pages and Twitter and everything. And if I post something, who knows how many people see it? Because Facebook yeah. throttles it and, and all yep. that. Last well, stat was about 5% organic reach is what you can expect to reach. So and, and that's just that that so the thing that I like the most is my own newsletter because they've signed up for it. Yes. And and they get free stuff. And then I actually send it direct to them and they read what they want. And I give them links to free stuff and and so go to wordfire.com and sign up for my newsletter. There you go. Um, <laughs> awesome. But that, and the other thing is, is that I control that. So Facebook yeah. decides to kick me off for 24 hours because I did a joke that they don't like, even though they post everyone else's misinformation, then they don't have to, uh, uh, they don't control it. It's my newsletter. But yeah, we, know. we beat that drum quite a bit on this show as well, when we're kind of doing our author centric episodes and the importance of a newsletter for that very reason. I did want to kind of shift back into, uh, into, to your stuff and your love of music, which I, I touched on at the top. There are people who love to listen to music while they write. And then there are people who really love music when they write. And in your case, you can't really talk about Kevin J. Anderson without talking about Rush whether it's the, you know, 2113 anthology you were a part of, the Clockwork series, which we're obviously going to talk about here in just a minute, because right now, you know, we got Clockwork Destiny is out, and that's obviously a huge thing. But I want to start from the top. When were you introduced to that band, and what was it about them that made them such a really unique muse for you to use? Well, and I was, again, as, as a little kid, I lived in this small town out in the middle of nowhere in rural Wisconsin, and 
Um, I think I was sophomore in high school, junior in high school. That's that's when you discover that you don't like your parents' music. Yeah. And and I wanted to, I mean, that was when I, my parents gave me the Beach Boys because that was acceptable enough. And then I kind of graduated to the Beatles, except the Beatles had so many drug songs that my parents didn't like that so much. So, uh, but I... I went to Germany for a couple of weeks as a student exchange when I was a sophomore at high school. And after two weeks, I, I was there and I listened to, it was American Top 40 and they played uh, Sticks Come Sail Away and they played Hotel California by the Eagles and they played Carry On Wayward Son by Kansas. And I just went, this is home, I've got to have this. So when I went home, I bought those three albums and I really got got heavily. The Eagles was a little too country for me and their other mm -hmm. stuff. So I got much more into um, Sticks in Kansas. And I got this this thing in the mail to join the Columbia Record Club. And, you know, all uh, this stuff is, yeah. is but but when you live out in the middle of nowhere, mm -hmm. you would it's like a book club, only it's a record club. And, and they gave you this sheet with like little stamps with album pictures on the covers of them. And you could pick something like 12 albums for five dollars if you joined. And I'm like, I'm going to join this so I can listen to real music. And I put, you know, the sticks, the Grand Illusion in Kansas and and things. And and then I ran out. I didn't know what else to, to pick. And I saw there was this science fiction related stuff. There was Alan Parsons project, iRobot. I went, that sounds cool. And I put that down. And and they had Alan Parsons had an Edgar Allan Poe album. And, and I picked that one. And then there was this thing with a big red star on the front called 2112. And I'd never heard of it, but it looked like science fiction. So I thought, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that down. And then I saw that it was by Rush. And I, I saw that Rush also had Farewell to Kings with like this ruins of a castle and a puppet string guy. And I went, oh, let's try that. And then Fly by Night, <coughs> I'm sorry, Fly by Night had this big giant owl on the cover of it and i thought that looks a lot just give me everything with rush on it and you know when at that age you're trying to get music that you know will annoy your parents and and i'm i'm playing this and obviously these are early rush songs so getty lee's got this high wailing voice that that rolling stone compared to a man suffering from testicular torsion <laughs> and Alex Lifeson has these great pounding guitars and and uh, there's like this one song on Cygnus X1 on Farewell to Kings where this guy's in a in a ship and he gets sucked down into a black hole and at the end of it he got these guitars pounding and and Neil's drums going and Getty's going wailing as he's sucked down in the black hole and oh boy is that music that will annoy your parents and and I just but but also I was this nerdy kid in high school and I had bad hand-me-down clothes and, and my mom gave me a haircut and I had thick glasses and and all these songs about, ooh, baby, baby, my girlfriend left me. I was like, well, I was never going to get a girlfriend, so that didn't have any meaning to me. And and uh, if I was never going to get a girlfriend, I might as well listen to Rush. So I was playing all that. And and they're just songs that inspired me with, you know, Black Hole Adventures and and battling the necromancer and and uh the greek gods inside an alternate universe and and it just really really inspired me and my i was plotting my first novel this was when i was in college plotting my first novel uh called resurrection inc which was all sort of a gothic horror science fiction murder mystery thing uh and as i'm plotting this and all the stories or the chapters are coming together, Rush came out with their album called Grace Under Pressure, which is kind of like this dystopian science fiction album. And I, of course, played it a million times. And as I'm playing it, I'm realizing like every one of these songs is like a scene in my book. Ooh, let me play with that. So I made sure that every one of those songs had a appearance in my book. And when the book was was published in 1988, I put an acknowledgement in the front that this novel was in uh, special thanks to uh, Getty Lee, Alex Lifeson, and Neil Peart from Rush, whose haunting album, Grace Under Pressure, inspired this novel. And when the book came out, I got some address for Mercury Records 
and I signed a copy for each of the three guys and I just mailed it off to Mercury Records. And, you know, it was like going into the warehouse of the Ark of the Covenant, it just disappeared. And but then a year later, I got a letter with a Canadian stamp on it and it was from Neil Peart who had read my book and he loved it and asked if I wanted to keep corresponding with him. So Wow. And that actually dovetails nicely. And the next question I had for you is how does that happen? It's one thing to be a fan of a band even somebody, you know, with, with, you know, with your brand, obviously, and your platform, but I mean, to take it a whole. Well, I didn't have other... it in 1988. So it was just me <laughs> starting out. I was a, I was a nobody with one novel published. And well, that's, I mean, that's, that was actually my next question is how does that happen? You know, Neil particularly is, you know, from my understanding was very, you know, well known as being a very quiet guy, you know, a guy who was very private, very personal, like to keep to himself. So, you know, how did that friendship come to be? And, you know, taking it one step further, when did you guys decide we got to write something together? Well, cause we, we corresponded a bunch and, and this was in actual corresponding days where you would actually put a letter on a piece of paper, sure. you would mail it. And Neil, it was scary because Neil would always send me these seven page single space letters. And you don't just like, you forget with email when you do like this little one sentence and fire it off, that writing a letter like that takes you days. And, and then I'd have to answer the damn thing and I'd have to be as intelligent as Neil was. Right. And we'd have these long discussions on and on. And, and then, um, he was coming around like 1991, I think uh, they were on their show of hands tour and they, they played in um, the San Francisco area where I lived. And Neil at the time liked to go around on bicycle between tour stops. He later graduated to motorcycle, but he, he liked to, he was super bicyclist. He used to bicycle. And so he, um, he asked if he, could stop by and I had him sleep on this. I was single at the time. I lived in a little townhouse and Neil rode his bicycle from Sacramento to Livermore, California, like a two hour drive. So who knows how long the bicycle ride was. And he just bicycled up and he stayed with me and slept on the couch and uh, went off to his tour in the Oakland amphitheater the next day. And I went and saw him and um, you know, we, brainstormed and corresponded for a lot and let's see he used to take these tours he would go by himself and take these bicycle tours around africa and he climbed mount kilimanjaro and he was like he's this drummer by himself bicycling around these little tiny villages in in east africa and he'd write me these long letters with these incredible descriptions of of these creepy villages he would see and and the cultures and the weird stuff and then I got invited to write a story for this anthology called Shock Rock, because a rock music inspired short stories or horror stories or something. And I thought, well, why don't I do a story about a drummer bicycling, th bicycling through creepy Africa? And I had a really, he comes up with this, comes to this village that is famous for their drums. And it's because they make the drums out of human skin. And there's all kinds of really great stuff. And I said, Neil, can I just steal all of your description from all these letters that you sent me and we'll call it a collaboration. And, and he said, sure, because we wanted to do something. And that that story was published as Drum Beats. And we just published that as a, after he passed away a couple of years ago, I did the hardcover version of it with uh, brand new illustrations in it. And anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm going on it at great lengths, but uh, it was a great friendship. I knew him for 32 years. Um, uh, he, he passed away in 2020 out of, uh, from brain cancer yeah. very, very shortly after they finally retired after 40 some years of touring together. And, and it was really sad because he, he was never a huge fan of touring. He liked making the music, but he didn't like the tour bus and the city to city things. He would rather have stayed home, but, um, anyway, so we, uh, when they were planning their last studio album called Clockwork Angels, which came out in 2012, I think, um, it was all a steampunk fantasy adventure concept album. And Neil kept writing me and asking me about steampunk stuff because 
he got introduced to steampunk from reading a bunch of my novels like captain nemo and the game earth books and uh, the mark of war uh so we love steampunk and he keeps asking me all these questions and i'm helping him brainstorm the story that's throughout this album and i'm like rush fanboy like cool i'm doing stuff with this album and then one they had recorded the first couple of songs and he was working on the other ones and uh, my wife and I had lunch with him in Santa Monica, this little diner. He loved to go to dive diners. And he's just all pumped up and saying that, you know, Clockwork Angels, it's going to be their their best album. And it is one of their very best albums. Uh, and he says that that it's got this whole great story and it's not just going to be their album, but it's going to be a, a Broadway musical and it's going to be a novel and it's going to be Ice Capades. And I'm fanboy going, oh, cool, Rush Ice Capades. Uh, and my my wife, though, says, but Neil, a novel? What do you mean it's going to be a novel? Who's going to write the novel? And Neil goes, well, Kevin is, of course. And then he goes on to talk about the ice capades. Uh, and so that's how Neil and I will show off. This is this is the Hugh Syme artwork from the album. And, and we wrote Clockwork Angels, the novel. And what was funny, so I'm I'm writing the novel and sending the chapters to Neil back and forth. Um, the novel of this album. And this is Rush. Rush has got more platinum records than any other band in history. This album, when it came out, was the number one album in North America. They were going on tour for a year and a half to sell out crowds of 30,000 people, 15,000 people, every whatever the arena would hold. And we had already had a standing order from the beginning that when we did this novel, that the, the souvenir stands would sell our novel with the t-shirts and the program books. Wow. And I couldn't get any of my publishers to even agree to publish the book. They all turned it down. They said, well, how do you write a novel based on an album? And do Rush fans even read? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and remember, so I, I told you, know, Rush with their platinum <laughs> albums and all this stuff, and and I'm no slouch either. I had 23 million books in print and 50 bestsellers. And none of my publishers would touch it. They just didn't want it. So we went to uh, Neil's Canadian publisher, ECW Press, and they knocked it out of the park. They published a beautiful book. It hit the New York Times bestseller list the first week it came out and um, won some awards. And then we, a few years after that, Neil and I wrote Clockwork Lives, which is sort of like a steampunk Canterbury Tales with a bunch of the characters and that mm -hmm. that is my favorite of all my books. And wow. uh, it just meant so much to me that won the Colorado Book Award and it just has a special place in my heart. Uh, and and Neil wrote me after he finished reading it and he said that this is surely your finest work. So it's like right up there with me. And then uh, Neil and I got the idea for our third one uh, we got this cool idea that would tie in a last adventure with the characters and and also it would bring in the classic Rush Vitor and the Snow Dog set up and, and all kinds of things. And we were plotting it and had some great ideas. And then Neil found out he was dying from brain cancer. Right. And so we we plotted a bunch, but you know, whenever we would see each other, that's not what we talked about. We kind of hung out and and I just put all my notes and I kept them and and uh, Neil passed away and I just put everything away. There was I wasn't going to do anything with it. And then a year after his death, I just kept thinking, I, I got to look at this. I got to get back to it. And I reread the notes and I I stayed in touch with Neil's widow. I'm still in touch mm -hmm. with her. And I said, look, Carrie, I've, I've got this. We worked on this and I won't do anything if you don't want me to. But but what would you think if I finished this book that Neil and I were working on? And she gave me her full on 100% support. And so we we did it. I, I worked on it and it was like a, a fire hose. Once I got started on it, I wrote that whole book in like a month. It just poured out of me. It was so cathartic and it may well be the best thing I've ever written. And wow. it just came out last or in June. There we go. Clockwork Destiny. Again, ECW Press. We just kept going straight back to the Canadian publisher because that 
they did such a great job. Why would we go anywhere else? Sure. And and I love that book. I wrote um, the afterword to it that kind of broke my heart. And Neil was the audiobook narrator for Clockwork Angels. He read the audiobook. It's got a beautiful voice. And we've got um, all three of the, well, because Neil did the first one, Clockwork Lives is like Canterbury Tales. So there's a bunch of different readers of the different stories. And then because Neil did the first one, I felt I should do the last one. So I recorded the audiobook of the last one. And we've, my wordfireshop.com website, I've got signed um, MP3 audiobooks there and other stuff too. But anyway, these the very special things to me. I love those books so much. And and it's the music that's connected. And, and through Neil, I got one of my very, very, very best friends in the whole world is Don Perry, the drummer from Jethro Tull. And I just got a text from him this morning and we talk all the time and um, and just some lots of other friends. And Neil's network has just kind of expanded and connected all of us. And yeah, yeah, anyway, that's clockwork books. I really like them. So, yeah, I um, just one one thing on on Neil, and I couldn't help but think about this as you were kind of talking about that. You know, yet again, another shining example of the unifying power of music. You know, if you went on Twitter the day of his passing the memories and the rest in peace notes and all of that from everybody didn't matter if you were conservative liberal somewhere in the middle didn't matter if the day before you hated each other over college football or politics or whatever everybody could agree people we we lost a good one today god bless and we'll miss him and it was just it was it was one more reminder that music can be that thing that unites everybody it's one of the reasons we love it as much as we do as fans so one thing I did want to ask you about uh, kind of stepping outside of Clockwork Destiny for just a second, because one of, the, one of the other things that you're obviously very big into right now is the Dune universe. That's a franchise that's very much on the rise with the with the Dennis Villeneuve movies. Um, second one's already on the way. Uh, you've got the House of Atreides graphic novel that you co-wrote with Brian Herbert that's been nominated for the Dragon Award this year yeah. for Best Graphic Novel. How did all of that get started and kind of what can fans expect in the, you know, in the near future from that collaboration? Well, that's another big, long story, but, but I was a huge, huge Dune fan. I read Dune when I was like 11 yeah. and it just, I mean, I, I loved science fiction. I was reading it all on um, Edgar Rice Burroughs and Andre Norton and, and Arthur C. Clarke. And, but then when I read Dune, it was just like a whole leveled up another couple of notches. It was like, wow, there's, there's politics and ecology and big complicated storyline and and I loved it and then I read um, through Children of Dune and I bought God Emperor of Dune was the first hardcover book I ever bought with my my uh, own money and then there was Heretics of Dune uh, and Chapter House Dune and those are all the ones that Frank Herbert wrote and right around then like I said my first novel Resurrection Inc. Um, Frank Herbert was such a huge influence on my writing that when I published, when I sold my first book, I joined the Science Fiction Writers of America, which is our big professional organization. And when you join it, you get their membership directory. And so I got Frank Herbert's home address. And I had made up my mind I was going to send Frank Herbert the very first signed copy of my first novel because he had been such an influence on me. And between the time that I had sold the novel and before it could be published, Frank Herbert died. So I never got the chance to meet him or send him anything. Uh, but when Frank Herbert died, the story that he was writing with Chapter House Dune, it just ends on a cliffhanger. And so I kept waiting for like 10 years, wondering why his son Brian wouldn't finish this story, because as a fanboy, I wanted to read how the story finished. And um, finally, through uh, through a guy who was uh, running Dragon Con at the time, who was a mutual friend, he gave me Brian Herbert's address. And I wrote Brian a letter saying, are you ever going to finish this story? And if not, could we maybe uh, work together on it because it needs to be finished? And, and Brian and I just really hit it off. In fact, about 
15 minutes before this interview started, we had been on the phone, Brian and I, for about 45 minutes brainstorming stuff. So awesome. uh, we've been like very close friends for 25, 26 years now. Awesome. Anyway, so there's there's that. There's Dune. See, I brought my own little props. Dune, the graphic novel, that, that uh, part two just came out. And in fact, the artists inside that one, this is not the, uh, we have two different things. The House of Atreides is our prequel to Dune. And we wrote that as a novel and published that uh, with, through Bantam Books. But then through Boom Studios, we did the comic books of it, just the whole visual version of it. And it's that collection that's on the Dragon Awards ballot. But the Dune graphic novel, which is just a scene by scene graphic adaptation of Frank Herbert's novel, that um, that came out in 2020 and that won some awards too. But the artists who are from Spain, they're coming over to Dragon Con to be artist guests at Dragon Con. So I'll be with with my my artists from this. Uh, they'll be at Dragon Con and I'll meet them face to face for the first time. And and so I'm um, doing comics. I've always been involved in comics and just by um, a lot of people know about doom but they're afraid to read it because it's like this big doorstop book and it's very dense and hard so by doing the the graphic novel versions of it we can introduce a whole new audience to that universe um brian and i have done i think 18 dune books together um plus the comics and you know we worked on um consulting for the movie and other stuff so Awesome. Well, I believe that is the end of my questions. I know the guy sitting down on the right little square on my screen here wearing the Rush t-shirt has probably been hanging out for the better part of the last 45 minutes, just chomping at the bit to ask questions of his own. Kev, I'll get to you in just a second, but Rob, what you got for us, man? You got something you want to ask the man before we let him go? No, I actually don't. He answered most of the things that I feel comfortable asking him about neil and about rush and about clockwork angels i will only say that i as a rush fan since 80 or so i do think clockwork angels is their best album i do think it is their masterwork i do think uh it's it's everything that that was their entire career with all of the yeah. skill of all that years of practice so mm-hmm. everything else that i would want to know seems intrusive and well, the I just want to comment that the very last song on that album called The Garden. Oh, my God. I'm going to cry. I always do. <laughs> well, when And it is probably their best song ever. I mean, it, it is the most meaningful song about the meaning of life. It just really. And when the day that Neil wrote that song, he sent me an email saying, oh, my God, I think I just wrote the most beautiful song I've ever done. And I kind of nailed it. And I just figured out that. At the end of your life, when you're looking back, it doesn't matter how many houses you have or how much money in your bank account or how much uh, famous stuff you have. It's how much love and respect have you earned. Right. Yep. Kevin, that just nailed. Kevin Steverson, you got anything you want to ask Kevin J. Anderson before we let him go? Maybe songwriter to songwriter. Well, I just, you know, talking about, about Neil, um, you know, everybody... He says he was the greatest drummer in the world, and I believe that. he. I think he was the best drummer ever. But to me, as a lyricist, I, I don't think anybody's touched it. And I listen to a lot of country music. I write some country. I write some rock. And country tells a lot of good stories. I just think that he's probably, God, top, one of the top five lyricists ever. Yep. You know? Yep. Could not agree more. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we could do this all day. Fingers crossed that Mr. Anderson will want to come back next time so I can pick his brain on who was more fun to write, Batman or Superman. Just a little personal personal thing I'd like to know. We'll save that for another day. But uh, for folks who want to find him online, he is on Facebook. He is on Twitter, at the KJA. You can also learn more about him at uh, Wordfire Press. We're going to put links to all of this in the show notes for this episode. So whether you're on YouTube watching this or you're listening to it, on apple google etc just check your show notes everything will be right there kev anything else i missed before we let you go anything else you want to pub or anything you want the readers to know before they go find you yeah well if you just put the links in there like i said where before that our, our newsletter is the way we like really keep in touch with our fans so if you cool. like my stuff just to sign up there and we'll give you other things but you know 
thanks for reading and thanks for doing it. This is the stories I want to tell. And, and I love doing it. And I just hope other people love reading them. Well, we certainly enjoyed having you on the show, man. And I do want to mention, though, to Kevin Steverson that uh, I'm going to go and make a whole set of tacos tonight instead of enchiladas. So I'm gonna... <laughs> nice. My, my multi talent, I also cook around here, too. So <laughs> this Taco yeah. Tuesday, ladies and gentlemen, as we record this. Sometimes, if we run into each other again at another con, I like to sit down and talk with you a little bit about uh, graphic novels and that kind of thing. Um, sure. They finished the script for, for my books for the movie. Right now, they're fine tuning it to get it to 120 minutes. But you know, that's, that's going to follow after the movie comes out. You know, that's, that's something I want to look at. So I pick your ear on that kind of thing. So as long as you're buying the beer, we're fine. <laughs> uh, <laughs> nice. All right, folks, Kevin J. Anderson, go find him, check your show notes. He's on the web. He's on socials. He is a great guy and a fun follow. Kevin, thanks for coming on the dudes in hyperspace, man. We have genuinely enjoyed this. Thanks. Thanks yep. very much, Kevin. See you, bud. All right, for you YouTube people who have to deal with my little uh, bounces here of sound, now I have to pull up the sounder for halftime. And that's assuming that Microsoft Windows Media Player wants to play, and it does not appear that it does. But that's okay. Halftime is the segment where we give a shout out. <laughs> I tell you, man, I've really got to find a better platform than Zoom to do this. I really do if we're going to keep doing video. But dadgummit, man, everybody knows how to use Zoom. So that's kind of the whole spiel. Halftime is, of course, the segment where we give a shout out to our presenting sponsor. That is the good folks at Chris Kennedy Publishing. We say it at the top. We say it proud and loud because <clears throat> it's true, y'all. Doesn't matter what you're into. It's military, sci-fi, space opera, urban fantasy, paranormal mo romance. They got it all. Go to Chris Kennedy publishing.com read about their books their series their authors also sign up for the newsletter get yourself a free email as kevin j anderson just touched on it man if you got an author or somebody that you really want to follow yeah we we get to be personal on social media but if you want to hear from us sign up for our newsletter chris kennedy publishing.com they got one of those so go check it out we have also got new releases happening this week in the world of the eldros legacy rob you want to tell us a little bit about that absolutely Book seven of The Eldritch Legacy is Embers and Ash by Marie Whitaker. Game of Thrones meets Lord of the Rings in this gothic epic fantasy saga of captivating court intrigue, deadly reigning evil, and a young queen's determination to free an empire. Princess Mahela Belagrave nearly escapes her fate as queen, but murder accelerates her ascension to the throne of Pyronon. Denying her birthright is no longer an option. She must embrace the magic she's possessed since birth but hidden out of self-preservation banu in an immortal demon construct and ancient palace knight lives on as the royal advisor he's ruled pyronon through its queens and their magic for centuries he's hidden truths and kept the loyal kingdoms of pyronon in the dark about life and death threats that imperil the mortality of every living soul on the continent banu sets his trap for the new queen he refuses to lose his long-lived and lasting power over the fiery continent of Pyronon and the reigning queen of the Empire. In a world plagued by centuries of evil possession, can a determined young queen embrace inherited magic and fear Pyronon from a throne long tarnished by a deadly legacy of deceit? Boom! Other new releases happening this week would be a brand new book in the Four Horsemen universe titled The Lion's Pride from uh, Chris Kennedy and Marisa Wolf. A lot of big talk about this one, guys. Uh, Chris Kennedy was discussing this one on the CKP, the Future Books podcast with host Randy Willis. Went on record as saying, this is probably my favorite Four Horsemen universe book. And in a universe where there's like 75, 80 books, them's big words, particularly when you're one of the universe creators. So the Lion's Pride with Chris Kennedy, Marisa Wolf also had uh, Marisa do a reading for CKP Confidential. A uh, lot of good stuff. One other thing of note about the Lion's Pride, guys, uh, this is built to be a fresh entry point to the 4HU. So if you're a listener of this program and you haven't had a chance to really delve into one of those, you know, 80 books, this is a great place to start. You can plug in if you haven't read Cartwright's Cavaliers, et cetera, et cetera. This is a point uh, where you can you can kick that off and, and start in fresh. So again, the Lion's Pride, check that out. In addition to Embers and Ash from Marie Whitaker. Other stuff happening this week would be new out in audio, this is uh, Wildcat, Foreclosure of a Dream. Great freaking title, by the way, from William Joseph Roberts. That's set in the Fallen World universe, so go check that out. And then in other news, we got some bargain books on the docket for you. This will be for Wednesday and Thursday, if I'm not mistaken. So if I can get this thing edited and out tonight, if not first thing in the morning, uh, you guys will have two whole days by the time you listen to this to be able to go grab Minds of Men 
by Casey Azell. Uh, that was a Dragon Award finalist, one I've actually read. Fantastic book. So uh, if you love psychic pilots in World War II, man, like that's kind of what she's doing there. She rocks it. So again, that's Minds of Men on sale from CKP for just a buck Wednesday and Thursday. And then finally, uh, we need some launch team readers for the Futility of Intent. I swear I'm going to get this right this time, Mike. That is book four of the Anesian Convergence by my buddy Mike Wyatt Jr., also fellow follower on Twitter. Good dude, that guy. So make sure you go check that out. Again, if you want to be on the launch team for that, go to chriskennedypublishing.com, shoot them a message, and uh, and they will get you hooked up and on the list for that. So, all right, I'm going to try this sound thing one more time. And if it screws with me, well, then I'm just going to have to do it all in prose pride. But, you know, audio listeners, you always get it right. That's because I get to edit it, which is awesome. Uh, actually, don't need sound for this one. Sorry, guys. We're doing some different stuff on the Dudes in Hyperspace right now. We are uh, actually going to kind of table our pod mail segment for a while. Normally, this is the stretch in the show when we get into pod mail. Uh, honestly, in the interest of trying to make you guys a little bit more shorter bite-sized shows, uh, we're going to table that segment for a while, and occasionally we'll pop in and do a mailbag show where we just do nothing but answer your questions. But in the meantime, to try and keep episodes from running into the hour and 45, two-hour uh, two mark, uh, we are going to kind of segue out of halftime into a brand new segment we're calling Air It Out. And I don't have any sounders for it or anything like that, just uh, it's what we decide we want to talk about as all three of us uh it can be book related stuff can be scheduling event news project updates so on and so forth could be what we think is going to happen in the upcoming nfl season it just doesn't really matter it's whatever we want to talk about it's an air it out segment so uh rob i'm going to start with you man what's happening in the world of how uh what's going on in eldros what do you what do you got for air it out and he's muted he's muted Yes, yes. First of all, I'm learning how to use the mute button. <laughs> yeah. Nice to know that I'm not the one with uh, with all the hiccups tonight. People who are listening to this show for the first time who came here for Kevin J. Anderson are like, who the hell are these chuckleheads, man? What a pack of idiots these guys are. And here oh. I was, uh, I, I muted myself because I had to cough, and then I forgot the other part. No, uh, I'm recovering, <laughs> really, is what I'm doing. <laughs> I'm still recovering from Penzig. Penzig is such a, an amazing thing, but to get there it took a little bit me. It took me a little bit out of the way. I ended up driving over 3,500 miles on the trip. Uh, I was gone for 24 or five days. Um, I I crossed. Let's see. Um, I hit Iowa. Well, Kansas, Missouri, Iowa, South Dakota, North Dakota, Minnesota. Wisconsin, Michigan, Dude. Ohio, Pennsylvania, Indiana, Illinois. You're like a Johnny Cash song, man. Yeah, I know it really was. <laughs> uh, it just worked out that way because we had a, a family reunion the week before, and it just kind of went went that way. It was a great time though, and I'm so glad I get to do it. It's uh, I sold way more than I expected. I met a lot of people, and honestly, Pendic is you don't quite know how much you miss something until it's not there. And those two weeks have been really important to me over the years, uh, not just as a person, but as an author and, and as a chance to, to be creative and come up with new stuff. And, and this was a brilliant year for it. Um, so I'm home, but the trip is tiring and I'm, I'm still trying to catch up in my brain more than anything else. <laughs> After that much driving, I'd imagine so. Kevin Steverson, what's going on in your neck of the woods, man? You know, Rob talking about that traveling and that driving reminds me when I was tour manager for Cypress Spring, that that feeling you got, Rob, because there's week after week after it just never went away from month, two months, three months, four months. I and had a year where is... I put uh, 45,000 miles in the car. I literally spent more time underneath my tent roof that year than i did my own house yeah that's 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 craziness mm. we did we did a west coast run where we did uh 12 shows in 17 days all the way out through california and back and it it's just exhausting but i bring that up to say september 30th in north carolina cypress spring will have a show which is kalen and they've also called tyler to come down and do his own thing so both of them will be there and of course they called me yeah we understand you don't have time but do you have time so for one more, I'll be there as the tour manager for both those guys and them doing it together on the stage. All the other tour managers are going to freak out and the other artists and all that stuff because I hadn't been around the scene for three years. But it's where, gonna be where a is good this going to be at? It's going to be in North Carolina, Laurenburg, North Carolina on September 30th. 
All right, cool. So Lauren, it'll be a where, show. Yeah. For those who don't know North Carolina, where's that at? Um, it's about five hours from here. It's about it's, it's a little town up above uh up above the interstate. Uh, it's it's just a small town. These people own about you know whatever a couple hundred acres, and they and it's a big uh mud bog and then four wheeling and dirt track kind of place. Cool. So it's it's the outback ATV park is what it is. So cool. Cool, cool, cool. But you know, Caitlin will be there doing Cyber Spring. Tyler will be there, and they may do a couple songs together. So uh, Craig Mort, uh, Craig Campbell's going to be there, and you know he was featured on one of their songs, and I think they're going to do that song with him. He'll be there. Cool. So that's awesome. Yeah, cool, it'd cool, be pretty man. cool. But you know, it, it, that's just a one weekend thing, so it's not like I get back into it do a lot of traveling. I just don't have time between an author and CKP and 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 everything. I just don't have time to do that anymore. What are you working on right now? Like I know Rob is is deep into Eldros. I am. Eldros, I but what am are you doing? Working, I'm working on the third book in my fantasy series, trying to get that finished, okay. knock that out. Then I have, I've already started a, another salvage book. So that's already started too. Gotcha. Um, so, so I have those two things. I've got an anthology that I discussed with Chris that he wants to do. I go ahead and talk about it a little bit now, but I got to get ready to send all the emails out. Yeah, well, um, no, we, we can press pause on that. I, I know a little bit about the backstory on that. That sounds really cool. Let's save that for when we can give that a little bit more of a spotlight. Yeah. Cause I, I dig that. That's neat. That's a neat concept. And I should be mentioning some other stuff that I I've got done after he's done. So, yeah. So that's, that's what's going on. Uh, you know, nothing much. Uh, just, just staying busy. We, we, uh, here in about a week, we'll have a total of 70 books in Germany from, CKPI, Chris Kennedy Publishing International. So nice. Way to work. Sweet. So, Rob, what's going on with you? What else is going oh, on? I was going to mention that, uh, yes, The Eldritch Legacy is going mad. Uh, Embers and Ash is the fifth book, it, the fifth opens the fifth continent, which means we're going to have some neat stuff coming down the pike. But we're also got Kendra Merritt's The Pain Bearer coming in September, which is one of the best books we've done in this series so far. And we've done some stuff I'm really proud of. Uh, and then but the one I really wanted to mention is Christopher G. Nuttall, who many of you know from, he's written some fantasy, he's written a lot of uh, space opera and science, uh, uh, military science fiction. We're actually going to have him with a release, I believe, on the 27th of September called The Chimera Coop, which starts a new series from New Mythology Press called The Heirs of Cataclysm. And I would be remiss in mentioning that because, man, it's really good. I, I, and he's such a great guy to work with. Yeah. It, talk about prolific authors. That's yep. uh, that one's right up there. So well, all is rolling along in uh, Malone land. Uh, <laughs> I spent this morning watching a football film on Dan Marino uh, just because I have to, and you know, Anderson talked about this earlier. Do your, do your heavy lifting before you write it, man. That way you don't, hopefully don't have to go back and do a bunch of rewrites. Well, I've got to explain why this guy needs to throw a war ball the way that he does, you know, because of his size, because of his stature, you know, he's, he's got to change some things. And when it comes to being under duress and having to be able to get the ball out of your hand fast, I mean, nobody did that better than Dan Marino. I know there's a lot of people nowadays who can get it out as fast as he could, but in 1984, that guy was a man among boys when it came to just how quickly he could snap out a ball. So, you know, dissecting the mechanics of how he throws, where he positions the ball at his body, you know, up learning how to, you know, rather than coming up, coming back the load and then driving forward, he would come up and would come up and back at the same time, which helped cut time off of his release. So just understanding and, and kind of breaking down how that motion works and then trying to figure out, okay, so now I've got to do this with aliens on another planet. How am I going to do that? How does this apply? You know, but, you know, like I've said from the beginning on, you know, and I actually said this to, to Chris and Kevin in an email exchange that we had this week, you know, I really want Last Argonaut to be a book that sports fans will read and understand that, okay, this is a science fiction novel, but it's still going to resonate as something that, okay, this is authentic. You know, as a sports fan, there's, there's a lot of stuff in here from philosophy and from, you know, strategy and technique. And, and there's a, there's a method to this that really does fit with what I love about competition. You know, it's authentic, it works. But then at the same time, if you're writing to a readership that may not necessarily get that, you know, they're here for the spaceships and the aliens. You got to give them something that they can plug into and be able to follow and be able to understand, okay, I see why they did that now. You know, because I've been fed what I understand about the game and how this process works out on the field, I get why these characters are doing this now in this scene. I see where this is headed and I want to follow that story. 
So kind of getting back to, you know, the, the pacing that Kevin was talking about earlier, you know, being able to balance all of that. So anyway, I say all that to say, yeah, I spent a good chunk of the morning before I logged on for work today, watching old game footage of Dan Marino and people break down what made his release, the whole up and out technique, as it was called at the time. So, so prolific, um, fascinating stuff. Used to love to watch that guy play ball. Freaking, he was awesome, man. Um, let's see other stuff happened in my world. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but I will mention it because I've been a fan forever. Series finale of Better Call Saul was last night. And for those of us who have stuck around for that show for some time uh, to up to the end, I think there was a real big question. How is this going to go down? I mean, we saw the, the guns blazing finale that was Breaking Bad. We saw the epilogue for Breaking Bad that was El Camino. From the jump, Better Call Saul, while still set in that universe, was a very different show. And a lot of people love that about it. A lot of people didn't. And so, you know, regardless, I think everybody was really curious to know how are you going to land that plane? And I felt like Vince Gillen and Villain Skilligan and that crew, I felt like they did it. It was the ending that I really thought that show and that character needed in many respects. And I'm not going to spoil it for people who haven't seen it. It was the mirror opposite of the ending that you got in Breaking Bad. Very cerebral, very heady but very, very true to those characters. You know, um, Saul Goodman, Jimmy McGill, uh, Kim Wexler, you know, I mean, it, there's there's several other people that they bring back for the finale that, that fans of both franchises will recognize. And, you know, I haven't spent a night kind of, you know, sleeping on it and then dissecting it through the day. I was really happy with the way that they ended it. I really, really was. I, I don't know as a fan or a writer that there's anything I would have changed about it. I thought it was the ending that if you liked Better Call Saul, it was the ending that you really kind of hoped for. So uh, I got I got no real qualms with it. So, all right, I'm going to come back over here, video people, and I'm going to give another shot at this sound <laughs> thing. We're going to cross our fingers that this sucker works. One of these days... I got to break go down. Go. By my, I got to break down <laughs> and buy myself a roadcaster. So I got like actual buttons, which, you know, when you're legally blind, buttons are your friends. I will say that. But okay, we're going to try. Fingers crossed. Are we going to get it? I hear music. Oh, uh, we have bagpipes. It's back playing. Back good. <laughs> Thank you so much to Kevin J. Anderson for coming on the show. Absolute treat and an honor to talk to a guy like that. Music, books, he's our people, man. We love him. Hope he comes back sometime soon. Thanks, as always, to Chris Kennedy Publishing for sponsoring the show. Thanks to the International Association of Science Fiction and Fantasy Authors. I mentioned they got a book giveaway going on this, uh, this month because every month they give away free books. It's what they do. It's a big fantasy short story giveaway. So slide over to IASFA.org. Make sure you sign up for that. Just have some free reads, man. It's a good thing to have, particularly when gas is still at freaking $4.50 a gallon some places. Uh, let's see. Thanks, as always, to the Believe Podcast Network. They are the number one podcast network on the net for professionals. So make sure you go check them out at BLEAB.com. As always, if you love this show, we love to hear about it, man. You can do that on YouTube in the form of likes and channel subscriptions, shares and whatnot. Apple, Google Podcasts, if they'll let you leave a review in five stars, it's a huge help for us. So on behalf of Rob, on behalf of Kevin, I am Plum Give Out. I'm going to find some tacos. Me and Jay Malone. We'll see you next time. Do some hyperspace soon.